The Question, I think, is my favourite of the four Shelley poems that are in the collection. Um, I, I I find it and perhaps a little bit more complex, uh, complex a little bit more interesting than than, than the other three Shelley poems. Um, that's that's simply personal opinion. Um, I, I like the kind of the, the the irony at the heart of this poem. Um, I also like the fact that it's called the question, but we never quite know what what the question is. So. Uh, Shelley describes a dream, or, or the speaker describes a dream. Um, I, sh I should say, you know, we we don't know how far the, the speaker is is Shelley, or, or or is some sort of representative of him. This poem is is um, in iambic pentameter. Um, it has the same um, tendency of, of of other Shelley poems to to, to sort of do that. Um, notice the rhyme scheme: A B A B uh, A B C C. So you get these couplets at the end, which Shelley uses in in Odes to the West Wind as well. Um, I like that, again, it, it seems quite reminiscent of Wordsworth, a lot of it. I dream that as I wondered, by the way. It does not sound a million miles away from I wondered lonely as a cloud, does it even the word wonder? And I think Shelley's, again, deliberately kind of evoking those earlier romantics to sort of give this idea that still he feels that he's not quite living up to what they did. So, I dream that as I wondered, by the way, their winter suddenly was changed to spring. Well, you know, to the West Wind, he talks about this idea of winter changing to spring and that being, you know, a source of hope for him. So, it's, it's a political point, but it's also a simple pastoral point about nature, isn't it? And gentle odours led my steps astray, mixed with the sound of waters murmuring. Notice the gentility, to, uh, the, sorry, the, the gentleness of this. So, you know, the murmuring, the gentle odours leading him. So this barrage of senses, the, um, the, the smells, the sound, we get what he sees as well. But they've led his steps astray. Now, I said in Odes to the West Wind, you've got this balance with Shelley between the quite formal, quite controlled um style of the poem the iron bit pentameter and the language that he's sort of straining to get out of it and this perhaps feels quite similar you know he's, he's been led by nature but he still feels quite controlled along a shelving bank of turf which lay under a copse and hardly dared to fling its green arms round the bosom of the stream but kissed it and then fled as thou mightst in a dream quite a, a, a similar image there to to Alden a grecian urn actually from, from keats as well but again notice the the you know the elements of romantic love here that the fling in the green arms um the, the bosom of the stream this idea of, of, of nature being quite quite maternal um again that he, he ends with this stanza with, with the idea of, of, of a dream as well the idea that um kissing and, and, and fleeing that, that a dream is something that's always just 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 out of reach you know this this poem describes as a, a, an ideal state for shelley but it's just out of reach um, I guess in the first two Shelley poems we looked at, um, you've, you've also got the kind of nature almost being um, almost being amazing, but, but being held back. So if you think about the cold earth slept below, nature could be amazing, but he can't get over the death of Harriet. Um, stanzas written in dejection, everything's beautiful, but he can't see it. And this is the same thing. It's amazing, but it's a dream, and that's what makes it so amazing. In fact, it's just out of reach. There grew pied wind flowers and violets, daisies, those pearled octuary of the earth, the consolated flower that never sets, faint ox lips, tender bluebells out of whose birth the sod scarce heaved, and that tall flower that wets like a child half in tenderness and mirth. So again, classic Wordsworthian image over here, isn't it? The, the, the flowers there. Um, I love the idea of the constellated flower as well, you know, sort of again, li linking something, again, a Wordsworth idea really, isn't it? That, you know, we're, we're in heaven before we're born and, and after we die. So the heavens, the constellations are linked to the flowers, the idea of pantheism and that God is through all of it. Now, it's just the, the sod scarce heaved at the, at the birth. So the idea of sort of the beauty of childhood without any other pain. Now, you know, Shelley, as someone who um, had had lost children, either, either in pregnancy or just afterwards, I think that's a particularly um, poignant image. It's also a classic, um, again, romantic image from Blake, from Wordsworth, the child half in tenderness and mirth. You know, this is a classic pastoral, beautiful image linked to childhood, linked to, to nature in the way that we'd expect. Um, it's mother's face with heaven's collected tears when the low wind its playmate's voice it hears. So again, um, you know, this poem feels more religious than the others. Now, again, Shelley was um, atheist. So I think heaven is, is perhaps a more classical sense of heaven. You know, it, it, it's it's an ideal. It's a political ideal. It's not just about religion. But even so, um, I, I think I think Shelley is 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 more perhaps. Um, you know, the 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 dream is this kind of ideal of of, of what um, I guess what what a guiding principle of religion should be.
And in the warm hedge grew lush eglantine, green cowbind, and the moonlight coloured may. Notice the listing here, you know, the, the plenty here. There's, there's one thing, then there's another, then there's another. This, this listing of, um, of, of, of plants and, and flowers that he sees. Um, and cherry blossoms and white cups of constant and, and, and whose wine was the bright dew, yet drained not by the day. So the dew that doesn't disappear, you know, this perfect image. But again, these things are little hints, I guess, that, that this isn't quite real, you know, that, that Shelley can't quite be led astray because we, we see in the poem that he's not being led astray. It's quite a constrained poem. The dew can't, you know, the dew has to disappear. Um, and wild roses and ivy serpentine with its dark buds and leaves wandering astray so the buds and leaves are wandering just like Shelley was wandering um, and being led astray um, I think that's a deliberate echo there that, that, that we have you know from, from the the the, wild, the the roses and the serpentine like Shelley perhaps the dark buds are that that hint that that, um, that he's maybe more flawed you know that, that he can't quite do that and flowers azure black and streaked with gold fairer than any wakened eyes behold and i think that couplet at the end shows that real bittersweet nature of this poem it's beautiful it's amazing it's incredible but it's so amazing because when you're awake you can't see it yeah you cannot be beheld by the the, the woken eye that's what makes it so so beautiful and nearer to the river's trembling edge there grew broad flag flowers purple pranked with white and starry river buds among the sedge and floating water lilies broad and bright so again note that constant and 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 it's like he's trying to soak it all in before the dream is over there's a slightly frantic nature to this poem i think um which again it is straining against the gentle iambic pentameter um the the floating um, water lilies that are broad that, that are bright um again i think add to that which lit the oak that overhung the hedge with moonlight beams of their own watery light well again we've had the hedge we've had in, in the cold earth slept below we've had the moon in the cold earth slept below here it's a very different version of it um you know and again the the, the water and the moon and the nature all in one again this, this is as close to pantheism really i think as, as shelley gets and bulrushes and reeds of such deep green as soothe the dazzled eye with sober sheen so you've either even got the words worthy an idea of the sober pleasure there you know the deep green um is, is that mixture of the dazzled eye and the sober sheen that's exactly what Wordsworth talks about, you know, the spontaneous overflow and the deep thought. Shelley's got it in this poem. You know, you've got the dazzle, but also the sober sheen. But I think, whereas Wordsworth is, is the soberness is, is growing up and it's a natural part of growing older, the soberness in this poem is, is reality, isn't it? You know, this is a dream, this isn't, this isn't real and we can't quite, um, can't quite sort of pin it down. And then the tone, I think, changes... Uh, quite a bit in the last stanza me thought that of these visionary flowers okay so visionary i think has a double meaning visionary in, in the sense that they almost show us how to live they are visionaries you know that, that, that in nature we can learn an awful lot but also they're visionary because they are a vision you know that they're, they're in his head they're a dream i made a nose gay now a nose gay is like a bouquet of flowers bound in such a way that the same hues which in their natural bells were mingled or opposed like the like array kept these imprisoned children of the others within my hand um real irony in this last stanza so he makes up a bouquet a nose gate of these flowers notice that first word after he's described though bound he tries to recreate the beauty of nature in the bouquet that he creates in the nose gate but by saying that it's bound straight away we see that it's not the same hues they're not natural notice you know the same hues the natural bells were mingled or opposed that's that's not the case the, the they're not mingled they're forced together they're not natural here so you get this real tension again coming in that Shelley by trying to put it all together um has actually almost ruined what made it beautiful now I think that almost is the key to understanding the whole poem this whole poem is very controlled um this whole poem is Shelley desperately trying to pin down nature the listing the the wandering around trying to get hold of it the, the barrage on our senses but I think this shows that actually the irony is that by putting it into words he, he's actually lost it it's that idea in, in that Coleridge talks about in, in Kubla Khan. He's, he has his vision, he starts writing the poem, then he's disturbed and, he, and it's gone. He can't quite get it again. And I think we get it here. There's a real sad irony in this poem. Um, he's keeping them imprisoned, children. You know, So again, it's the beauty of, of nature, but, but he's imprisoned in it. Um, be a, weird, a weirdly interesting link with Blake there. Blake also talks about, I guess, imprisoned children, doesn't he, by society. Shelley, in a metaphorical sense, is talking about the same thing. So they're within his hand. So as soon as they're in his hand, and now it's that my hand, you know, it's something flawed about him. He's ruining it. And that's what we get in Ode to the West Wind as well. You know, this sense that he can't quite create what he wants to. He's a flawed poet. He... Um, he's, he's self-aware he, he's perhaps not um, seen himself as, as being as successful as the earlier romantics um, 
And then, elate and gay, I hastened to the spot whence I had come. So, you know, he goes back with, he's desperate to go back with this. Um, I like the, and then elate and gay, the sense that, you know, he's really, really happy, but we sense that he's going to sort of change it at the end of the poem. Um, that I might there present it, oh, to whom? And that's the question at the end of the, the question, you know, who do I give this on to? Who do I give this this mantle on? And, and you know, we, we could take this poem at face volume and we could say that actually what Shelley's saying is, you know, he wants to know who he's going to pass the mantle on, who's going to be the next romantic to come up, who's going to be the next generation, who's going to take this image further, which he sort of touches on with, with um, Out of the West Wind. And, you know, that his dejection here is the fact that he, he's, he's, he's on his own, and now he, you know, he's... he's He's not got anybody to sort of take the torch from him. Um, you could say it's about his 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 loneliness, or, or you know, ultimately the, the lack of children. He, he's his family about his lack of descendants to pass on the the torch to. So you know, we could make this personal about Shelley, but I think actually the preceding lines have have, have made another question actually, I, because the nose gate itself is is a flawed concept. The nose gate itself is an attempt to recreate nature in a very flawed man made way. So to me, the question isn't simply who do you give the nose gate to. It's why the hell have you just made the nose gay? You know, you you have just um, essentially ruined or imprisoned what made this so beautiful in the first place. So I think there's a deeper question here, which isn't just about Shelley saying, how do I pass on romanticism? How do who, Who's going to carry the torch in my poetry? There's also a question of him saying, how do I achieve in my poetry what I want to achieve when the nature of writing it kind of ruins what it is? Um, and I think that's why I like the question so much that, to me, the actual question of this poem is not the question that he ends this poem with.